Uh, thanks, Carol. Uh, a great, uh, it's really a, a, an immense delight for me to be here uh, in the National Women's Council's offices uh, to take part in this debate uh, and to have uh, the opportunity to put forward my reasons for why the Shannon is good for women, so vote no, and why citizens, women and men, women and men should vote no to the campaign, sorry, to the upcoming referendum to our Constitution. Um, 16 years ago, I had the privilege of taking up the role of the CEO of the N National Women's Council, as Carol has already referred to. It was a time of great change for the organization and for the country. I had to find ways to ask and answer some of the following questions. First of all, what do women want? <laughs> Secondly, how shall we represent what women want? Thirdly, how shall we get the political and social and economic change for what women want? Well. Uh, those were tough questions. In the process of trying to answer them, I had the opportunity to hire Orla O'Connor, one of the best things I ever did, currently the director. I also thought that something else might be helpful, to reignite a national debate on the meaning of feminism. I was committed to, I would like to hear you're a feminist, I was committed to finding a way to define it so that all women would be included, and this was not an easy task. And so we wandered through various types of feminism in the late 20th century. Modern, liberal, socialist, radical. And then we started to see glimpses of postmodern feminism that emphasized diversity, pluralism, deconstructing the norm of maleness and sameness and oneness. And we drew on how great women thinkers were examining the tensions between justice and love and care, and how the politics of identity intersects with the reach for social, economic, racial, and cultural equality. We struggled with the notion of how to use the European equality of opportunity mainstreaming model, liberal as it was, to provide a vision and a funding for the radical things we wanted to do for all women and for their children. Um, and this is uh, why, uh, by the way, I'm so heartened to hear the new debates uh, that are emerging from the voices of young women on new versions of postmodern feminism and implications for politics and the economy and for our society. But one of the most important things I learned during that era was this, that we could have all the best reasons in the world, the best <coughs> solutions to the problems, and I thought we did, rising from the ground to mesh with theoretic, theoretical visions of change, but if we did not have the openness within the political sphere to receive these, to deliberate with us about these, to understand from the inside out the struggles out of which these solutions were fired, then our great solutions would nudge very little change. And so, I stand or sit before you today <laughs> opposed to government claims that their recent proposals for doll reform, <coughs> Regina outlined some of them, will provide the Irish people with one parliament that is better for Irish constitutional democracy. I, I, I am here to argue that the Irish people instead need a radical Shannon and doll reform that will allow democratically elected representatives of the geographic regions and also of practical knowledge and experience to generate the best legislation through the direct dialogue with civic society and unimpeded by absolute executive dominance. This is the kind, I think, of the constitutional democracy that the Irish people deserve, and this is the kind of democracy I think that will ensure a just society so that everyone will be free. Now, to argue that the Shannon is good for women, I'm first going to take a wide-angle lens approach and ask what, and, and Regina mentioned the, uh, the issue of governance, and I think that's really critical. What kind of governance is best for all Irish people so that we have a rigorous system of checks and balances and an effective scrutiny of government power? Well, clearly our model of governance requires significant reform, and yes, I agree that it's appropriate to ask the people about what kind of significant reform they wish to see. And as the Tisha could say, it is stated, and he this is several times, even last night on Kalini, it is the Constitution that declares the people are sovereign. What could be more appropriate than asking the people to decide on the future of the Shannon? What could be more democratic than that? Well, indeed, Article 6 of our Constitution reads, all powers of government derive from the people whose right it is in the final appeal to decide all questions of national policy. That's what our Constitution says. And yet, the government has flatly refused with this absolute power of an overly dominant executive and whipped parliament, none of which is going to change with the doll reforms Regina's put forward, to put the issue of Shannon reform before the Irish people. The Taoiseach has declared that it isn't, it hasn't been reformed, and so it is unreformable. 
And yet, in a recent paper on past reforms examining the Shannon Electoral Act of 1947, Dr. Elaine Byrne, another great feminist, concludes the claim that the Shannon is unreformable is simply not true. It has been reformed and effectively so in the 1947 act that outlines the procedures for elections to the Shannon. But the Taoiseach didn't put the issue of Shannon reform before the people, and in independent polls of the Irish people, a significant percentage said that they are in favor of Shannon reform, in spite of the fact that the government has refused them this choice. I think this is an instance of the government denying the sovereignty of the people. Further, senators proposed 31 amendments to the Shannon Abolition Bill, that's the bill that created the referendum that we're now uh, being asked to vote on, that would have incorporated a mandate to the government to implement Shannon reform if the Irish people reject the abolition proposal. All of these amendments are legally possible, but were ruled out of order, including ones that proposed the issue of Shannon reform to revert to the Constitutional Convention. The government flatly refused, with no rationale, to have to let the people have their say on reform. Now, how is this an example of democracy? <laughs> the people are learning that the government does not consider them to be that sovereign in matters of politically reforming our institutions, and I think the people are angry with this. The government also makes charges of the Shannon's ineffectiveness. Well, while the Shannon in its current form doesn't have the strength envisaged for it by the Constitution, though I think this could be changed by a bill that Senator Fergal Quinn and I have put before the Oireachtas, and here it is, 75 pages, a real bill. There are countless examples of its effectiveness in generating, improving, and amending law throughout its history, and being a chamber of deliberative democracy, that is not the equivalent of a talking shop. Deliberative democracy, its members bringing forward progressive ideas forged through engagement with wider civic society. So now I'm gonna zoom in my lens to how the Shannon has been effective for raising issues of particular significance for women's freedom and prosperity. Well, in the late 60s, Senator Evelyn Owens brought her experience as a trade unionist to her Shannon speeches on workers' rights and consistently highlighted the plight of women in the workforce, forming the historical backdrop for reform uh, to, to, to government's anti-discrimination legislation. Mary Robinson pushed for reform uh, in the areas of social welfare, adoption, uh, employment rights, and illegitimacy. The Shannon was often the first place where debates took place on these progressive issues. In 73, Robinson introduced the first bill on access to contraception in Ireland. Senator Mary Henry put forward private members' bills on the prison and probation services and regulation of assisted human reproduction. Her bill prompted government to ask the Law Reform Commission to look at assisted reproduction. We're still looking at it. During Mary O'Rourke's, O'Rourke's time as Shannon leader, she proposed the Maternity Protection Bill that improved maternity protection employees, the Redundancy Payment Bill to ensure the rights of part-time workers to statutory redundancy, and in the current Shannon, Senator Gillian Van Turnout has been a crucial advocate of children's rights, April Power, an outspoken ally of LGBT rights, and of course, Ivana Bocek has worked tirelessly to see the implementation of gender quota legislation and women's access to safe, legal abortion. My own group of independent senators put forward motions on the future of prostitution legislation, which was the catalyst for a huge public consultation and report issued by the Oireachtas Justice Committee with radical recommendations for change in legislation that is laid now before both houses of the Oireachtas. If I widen the lens again, let me just offer a few words on the proposals that government has been recently brought forward for doll reform, arguing that these will be sufficient for one parliament to provide effective checks and balances on its powers. Well, not one commentator that I've read has agreed with this. Instead, as noted by some of our most eminent political scientists, they say virtually nothing in the proposals incentivizes the doll to be more aggressive in its scrutiny of government. But most importantly, I think, none of the government's proposals will be put in the Constitution so that the government can make these changes, and then they can reverse these changes according to their desires. So you know what? Doll reform is not being put to the people either. This contrasts starkly with the institutions of governance in Nordic countries that the government is so fond of using to boost its weak arguments to abolish the Shannon. Both Sweden and Denmark made changes to their constitutions to ensure a scrutiny of executive power when they moved to one chamber. 
In Sweden, a committee is constitutionally required to examine ministers' performance and handling of government business. And while ministers sit in parliament, they don't have a vote. In Denmark, their 1953 constitution strengthened checks on executive power when they moved to one house. And the 29th article of the Finnish constitution obliges representatives to follow justice and truth in their office. Translated, they can follow their conscience to check executive power without being thrown out of their parties and their offices. Okay. So let's contrast this, these government proposals for change that will not be constitutionally ratified by the people, nor it's not even being debated by the people, with concrete Shannon reform proposals put forward by Senator Quinn and myself. As I said, we have a bill that is the result of a wide and lengthy consultation with the people and that has passed, we've debated it in the Shannon, it has passed second stage of the debate in the Shannon, and that is a waiting debate in the, in the Dole. We propose to amend the Electoral Act of 1947 to open up the electorate of the Shannon to every adult in the Republic <coughs> so that a reformed Shannon would have one person, one vote, also giving a vote to immigrants and Northern Ireland residents. There would also be an equal number of women and men. So let me zoom in again and Orla referred to some of these priorities of the Women's Council. Abolishing the Shannon would abolish greater opportunities for women to participate in the Iraq. As you probably all know, 30% women represented in the Shannon right now, 15% in the doll. Throughout Europe, there has been much progress in improving women's participation in politics. But unfortunately, the rate of progress in Ireland has not improved significantly since the 90s. Ireland ranks a very low 25 out of 28 countries in the EU rankings. The gender quota measures brought in last year are of course to be welcomed. I voted for them. This legislation will mean that at the next general election, at least 30% 30, 30 of political party candidates will be put, will put, will put forward will, will be women. However, this doesn't guarantee that 30% of Dole deputies will be women after the next election. While the legislation eventually increases the gender quota to 40%, this increase will not come on stream until the general election of 2026. In addition, studies from other countries show us that while such matter measures do make an impact, the impact will not be seen for at least two or three electoral cycles. So must we wait until 2031 or 2036 for women to achieve parity and political representation? In contrast, our Shannon bill will significantly increase and much more rapidly women's participation and we could become a leader in inclusive politics. Further, the reforms that we put forward would mean that candidates for the Shannon would not represent geography as they do in the doll, but represent expertise and practical knowledge in education or farming or industry or human rights or equality or labor or literature or engineering. And political parties would no longer control nominations and elections as they do now. So new voices, independents, and minorities could be at the heart of our lawmaking which was the original intention, as, as, as Regina already outlined. To conclude, we are uniquely placed in Europe to imagine a radical new form of governance that includes a second house rather than excludes it. We have the opportunity to choose a diversity and breadth of voices rather than impose oneness and sameness. This, I think, is what freedom for all women and all men means today. So please, don't be fooled by the undemocratic and inaccurate ways in which the government has argued its position for abolition, and I invite you to vote now.